content so I got a few requests to work through some physics past papers with you so I will be doing November 2019 physics paper one and this is from the Department of Basic Education let's get right into it now just as a quick side note I'm not doing the entire paper because at this time of the year only certain sections have been covered according to the annual teaching plans I know some schools mix up the order of the topics so maybe you did topics that I'm not going to cover in today's video just let me know in the comments below and I will do a part two with the other questions if you are wanting that I just wanted to first point out the data sheet for physical sciences physics paper one that is attached to the back of all your papers so this is what your data sheet should look like this is the first part and these are all the physical constants so for example, today we'll be using the speed of light in a vacuum, that is for electromagnetic waves, that is symbol C, 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. We will also be using Planck's constant, the charge on an electron, electron mass. Um, you need to know that you can find these at the back of your paper. They should be included, they will be included, so don't try and memorize them out of your head, especially if you're going to get them wrong. Okay, then you also have formulae. So this is for the wave sound and light section so for transverse waves longitudinal waves electromagnetic waves this one here at the bottom we use for electromagnetic waves h is Planck's constant c is the speed of light you need to know these symbols and what they mean um, that's the only way that's how you start off with studying science so t is period and it's measured in seconds so you should have a summary page in your book where you have all of these things listed with the quantity and with the unit so t is period it's the period of a wave and the unit is seconds seconds or s and we know that t is equal to 1 over f where f is frequency frequency is f and the unit for frequency is hertz h z please don't get confused between the symbol of the quantity and the unit the unit is what goes at the end of your answers and you have to have it in order to get the marks V is velocity or the speed of a wave. So that's the speed of a wave and the unit is meters per second. Okay. Frequency is frequency. Like we said, this little symbol is called lambda. It represents wavelength and wavelength must be measured in meters. Okay. If you ever forget meters because your speed is in meters per second. E is energy and it's measured in joules. F is frequency, H is a constant, C is a constant, that's wavelength. If we go on to electrostatics, N is number of electrons, Q is charge, E is a constant, that is over here. E is a constant, you get it from your data sheet. I do have a video where I've gone over electrostatics, if you want to see that, please click the link above. This again, Q is charge, it's your final charge, and charge is measured in coulombs. And you may have to convert to coulombs and then we've got electricity again i have a video on electricity if you want to go watch that video i have a few actually i'll link the playlist over here q is charge measure, measured in coulombs i is current measured in amperes time measured in seconds resistance is measured in ohms this is a, a formula to work out resistors in parallel or effective resistance in parallel this is for series V is potential difference or voltage or potential difference. The unit is volts. W is work or energy, energy or work. And its unit is joules. And Q again is charge. There's another formula that's missing from this formula sheet. It's V is equal to I times R or I is equal to V over R, that's Ohm's law. So you need to be familiar with your formulas. If you want to see a video where I go over all of these in detail, show you summaries, let me know in the comments. Right, so the first question that I'm going to start with is question six, and this is clearly a section, the section known as waves. Over here, we've got a transverse wave. So remember, transverse waves are longitudinal waves, uh, sorry, transverse waves are mechanical waves. Um, transverse waves and longitudinal waves are both mechanical waves which means they need a medium to travel through like air water and so on when you get a wave in your exam please 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 always make sure to analyze your axes so what i mean by that is look at your y-axis it says amplitude in centimeters okay centimeters important and time in seconds 
Now, it's very important to note that they can either give you a wave on a graph like this, where, sorry, it's not drawn very well, where this is distance or amplitude or something, just like this graph, the y-axis. The x-axis can also be distance in meters or centimeters or whatever. If they give you a graph like this one up here, we can use the graph to find wavelength, lambda. However, because they've given us a graph like this where time is on the x-axis, we're not going to be able to use this graph directly to find the wavelength. So what I mean by that is you can't read off the graph and say, ooh, there's one wave, okay, starting there and ending there. So therefore the wavelength is eight. No, look, at, look carefully, the x-axis is measuring time. So if that's one wavelength, from a consecutive point to a consecutive point, that represents one complete wavelength. Then that eight refers to the period of the wave. Okay, so you need to be careful. You need to analyze your axes. Define the term amplitude of a wave. So the definition of amplitude, the maximum disturbance of a particle from its rest position. Just remember that the rest position is essentially this line over here, okay, the x-axis. So the amplitude is 50 centimeters, and that's actually the very next question. Um, so I think I skipped it. <laughs> but the very next question is, what is the amplitude of the wave? Write down the amplitude in meters of this wave. You need to read the question carefully, grade 10s. They want the amplitude in meters, so you need to look at your axes. I know it says 50, but look at the unit, centimeters. So we need to convert centimeters to meters. We divide by 100, so therefore our amplitude is 0, 0,5 meters. Then they say determine the period of this wave. And I know that earlier on I spoke about period, the formula for period as being one of a frequency. But can you see that in this question, using this formula doesn't make sense. They don't give us frequency. And based on what I said when I just showed you this question in the beginning was this. The axis, the x-axis is giving us time. So if I can find one wavelength on this graph, which is here from this consecutive point to this consecutive point. So this, these are points in phase. So from the crest of one wave to the crest of another, that represents one wavelength. And we can see that that is eight seconds. So that's the period. The period is eight seconds. And this is what I was speaking about earlier. T is the quantity. It's the symbol um, for period. Instead of writing out the word period, we write T. T is equal to eight seconds. Seconds is the unit. If you don't have the unit, you're not going to get the mark. And please, I mark the trick papers um, in science. If you say sec, they're not going to give you the mark. It has to be S or seconds. So either the full word or S, not sec. Then they want the speed of the wave and they give me the wavelength. Okay, so this is a five mark question. As soon as you see a five mark question, you know we're probably going to be using more than one formula. So let's think about what we have so far. A good way to approach these questions is write down your variables, write down what you have. So we have, they want speed, okay? They want speed and we know on our formula sheet, if we look at our formula sheet, we know that speed is V. V also stands for velocity, but we know speed is V. So we know speed. We know V. That, sorry, not we know. That's what we want. Okay, so we want V. Please don't get confused. Speed is V. The wavelength is 0, 0,8. So as I mentioned, wavelength is represented by the symbol called lambda. It's 0, 0,8 meters. It must be in meters. It is in meters. We're all good. The other thing that we just found out is that the period of the wave is 8 seconds. Now, if you look at the formula that we need in order to calculate speed, it is V is equal to frequency times wavelength. V is equal to frequency times wavelength. We know the wavelength. Remember, this is what we're looking for. This is our prize. This is what we're searching for. But do I know frequency yet? No, I don't know frequency yet. So my first step is to find F. In order to find F, I'm going to use a different formula. I'm going to use this formula. By the way, T is equal to 1 over F, and F is equal to 1 over T. Reciprocals of one another. That's lovely. Okay, so frequency 
is equal to 1 over t. If you want to use that formula as it is on the formula sheet, it's the same thing. Just substitute in properly. So I know period. It's 8. So therefore the frequency is 1 over 8. Now I'm not going to round this off. Yes, I can work it on the calculator. Yes, I know that it'll give me 0.125 hertz. You don't have to put the unit here because it's not the end of the question. But don't round off. You never, ever, ever round off in the middle of a question. So why did I work out frequency? Remember our goal? We worked out frequency now because we want to find speed. So now we have frequency. Now we have wavelength. We write our formula. Always write formula first. You have to have your blank naked formula first. That gets you a mark. If you skip that, you don't get that mark. The frequency, I'm going to leave it as a fraction, 1 over 8, or you can write it as a decimal. And then your wavelength they give you is 0, 0,8. Therefore, my answer for speed of my wave is 0, 0,1 meters per second. So grade 10s again, you get a formula mark. You get a substitution mark. Please substitute using brackets. And then you get an answer mark. But if you don't have your unit, then the answer's wrong. Because they asked for speed, and speed is a scalar. In other words, it doesn't need direction. This is your complete and final answer. Just as a side note, your other marks will be here and here. Because remember, you have to find frequency first. So the formula for frequency, substituting in. Formula for speed, substituting in an answer. Now, for two marks, they want us to calculate distance D on the diagram. Now remember D distance, that is related to meters, which is related to wavelength. What we already know is that the wavelength, the wavelength of this wave is 0, 0,8 meters. That information was provided to us in the previous question. So we're going to use that information to help us work out D. Now, what we need to do is we need to find out how many waves exist in this diagram between here and here, basically, how many waves are making up the span of D? And why do I care about how many waves are making up the span of D? Well, because I know one wave, this represents one wave. One wavelength has, a, it, the wavelength is 0, 0,8. So if I know I have two waves, then I multiply that number by 2. If I have three waves, I multiply that number by 3. So let's see how many waves I have. Remember, we said this is one wave. Then I'm going to use a different color. That is my second wave. Okay, so from crest to crest. So one wave, two wave, and this over here is a half a wave. So we've got 2,5 waves that make up distance D. Therefore, our distance D is equal to 2,5, so 2.5, multiplied by 0, 0,8. And that gives us 2 meters. Again, if you don't give me the unit, you're going to not get your marks. The next question gives me a different wave produced by a different source. Okay, So you can see they're plotting it on the same set of axes, amplitude and time. But this is the wave produced by B. So not the same as a different wave. And they want to know how does each of the following properties of the wave compare to that of A. We have to say, choose from greater than, smaller than, or equal to. So we don't have to go on and write a whole essay, we just have to write down one of these words. So amplitude and then frequency. So I've put them both on the same diagram over here so we can see. Remember that amplitude is a maximum disturbance of the particles from its rest position. So from here to here, that's the amplitude. Over here, it's from here to here, that's the amplitude. So how do the amplitudes compare? Well, B's amplitude is greater than okay so b's amplitude is greater than a and why because if we look at the two diagrams b's amplitude this is b over here and this is a b's amplitude is higher than 50 we can see that there a's amplitude is 50 centimeters okay then they want to know frequency now this question is a little bit more difficult because frequency is inversely proportional to period. So what, what that means is frequency is inversely proportional to period. That means that if frequency, that means that if period increases, frequency decreases. They do the opposite. Think about it. If I make the period, just let me write the formula for you. 
if I make the period 2, then the frequency is going to be 1 over 2, so a half. If I make the period 3, then the frequency is going to be 0, 0,3333333, which is smaller. So if I make t bigger, if I increase the period, the frequency is going to get smaller. That relationship is called inverse proportion. And this relationship is only inversely proportional if my other variables stay the same. Don't worry too much about that yet. So what I want us to compare here, basically, remember, these graphs are not giving me frequency. The question wants to know how do the frequencies compare? How does f compare? But this graph is giving me time, which is giving me period. So if you look here, one wavelength over here takes eight seconds. So the period of A, the period, the period of A is eight seconds, like we said already. For B, let's look at B. The period of B, so remember B, one wavelength would be from the crest to the crest. Do you see that? So what is the period for B? The period for B is four seconds. So what's happening to the period? The period of B is lower than the period of A, okay? Eight versus four. Therefore, if the period is going down, remember inverse proportion means the frequency must be higher, so greater than. So both your answers are greater than. I hope that makes sense. That last one was a little bit of a thinking question. 6.6 .6 wants us to calculate the frequency of the wave source produced by B. So I remember, frequency is equal to 1 over period. So like we said for B, from the crest of the one to the crest of the other two points in phase, we know that the period is 4 seconds. So the period is 4 seconds, therefore formula first, 1 over 4, therefore my frequency is 0, 0,25 hertz. You need, that's a Z by the way, you need to give me your units in order to get your mark. Formula, substitution, answer. Question 7 is still relating to waves. Over here we're doing sound waves, which are longitudinal waves. They give me a sound source. They say there's a sound wave. Looks like there's a building. Seems like there'll be a, um, an echo, basically a reflection of the sound. So first of all, to find the term longitudinal wave, you do need to study your definitions for science. Science, it's a very important part. You see it's two marks. For certain definitions, it's two or nothing. Sometimes they minus one. Um, in matric finals, we do that. We minus one if there's keywords missing, things like that. So you need to make sure you study these properly. I just wanted to show you guys um, these two triangles. They're relevant for the next question, but let's just read the question first. So it says a sound wave is produced by a source placed a certain distance from a building. The echo reaches the source after eight seconds. So what that mean, means, guys, is there's a sound source here, there's a building here. It sends out a sound wave, which hits the building. It is reflected off of the building. A reflection of sound, that's an echo. And this echo, the reflection of the sound, goes back and makes its way back to the sound source. Let's assume it's traveling exactly along the same path as it was originally, and it takes eight seconds to return to the sound source. So that means if it took eight seconds to go there and back, it means it took four seconds to go from the sound source to the building and another four seconds back. Okay, assuming that the sound source doesn't move in this time and obviously the building's not going to move. They want the distance between the sound source and the building. So they want distance, which in physics we call distance or displacement delta x. Delta means triangle. Delta, sorry, delta means change. It's represented by the triangle. So delta x triangle x change in position or distance okay in grade 9 math you should have learned that distance is equal to speed multiplied by time and some schools teach it in this triangle over here so the distance is equal to speed multiplied by time and speed is equal to distance divided by time the triangle basically just helps me get the different formulas we can do a the similar triangle but using the physics symbols so delta x is distance. Instead of speed, instead of s, we can use v. v represents speed. So this speed of sound and air, that is speed, that is v. And time, or delta t, 
triangle time, change in time. There we go, time. So basically, what we know from that triangle is the distance or the displacement is equal to speed multiplied by time. Or speed is equal to displacement divided by time. I hope that helps. Speed is equal to distance divided by time. Now, we, I'm going to use the formula in this form because that's the form that it is on the formula sheet. So that's your formula mark. You write your formula as is on the formula sheet. Don't sub in. We are looking for distance. We're going to leave that open. V, the speed of sound and air is 340. That is V, it's our speed and time. Now, because I'm looking for the distance between the sound source and the building, it makes sense to use four seconds because it takes four seconds to go from the sound source to the building. If I do that, I'm going to get exactly that distance. So from here, from A, from the sound source to B, the building. If I use eight seconds, like they gave me in the question, then I would be calculating double the distance, which you may do. You just must remember to divide by two at the end. So if I do it this way, I'm going to get one, three, one, three, six, zero meters. That is my distance of the building. Remember, if you use eight, you will have gotten double that number, but then you're going to have to halve it because if you use eight seconds, you're going to get the distance there and back. We just want to know the distance between the sound source and the building. Okay, so there we go. So that is your substitution mark and that is your answer mark with units. Then they want to know the property of a sine wave that influences its pitch. Pitch is influenced by frequency. Question eight. Again, we're dealing with waves. This time it is electromagnetic radiation. So basically, again, your formulas that you need to know. Okay, that's our first one. There's my second and my third one. Just take note, this third one should look familiar to you. The third one is basically V is equal to F times lambda. Velocity of the wave or speed of the wave is equal to frequency times wavelength. The reason that I've replaced it here with C is because all electromagnetic waves, all of them, travel at C, which is the speed of light, which is 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Okay, that is the speed for all electromagnetic waves, whether that is radio waves, microwaves, visible light, all of those waves travel at the speed of light. Okay, so there we go. There's our formulas. Remember, F is frequency. H is a constant. That's going to be in your formula sheet. C, again, is your constant on the formula sheet. Describe how an electromagnetic wave propagates. So how does it move? You need to remember that an electric field that is oscillating, that is basically in one plane, produces a magnetic field that is perpendicular or 90 degrees or at right angles to it. And that's how it propagates. Also, it travels through a vacuum. So that is basically something that you need to learn. It is theory work. Right. What is the relationship between frequency and energy of an electromagnetic wave as shown in the table above? So when they ask for a relationship, they mean mathematical relationship. So if the one increases, the other one decreases, the one increases, the other one increases, something like that. So if you look at frequency, we can see here that the frequency is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. 2 times 10 to the 9, 4 times 10 to the 12. You see my positive exponents are getting bigger. Look what's happening to the energy also increasing. I don't know if you can tell, but times 10 to the negative 24, times 10 to the negative 21, times 10 to the negative 18. So these little numbers here are actually getting smaller and smaller, but remember they're negative. So they're both increasing. And that makes sense if we look at the formula E is equal to H times F. Energy, okay, energy of a wave or energy of a photon, which is a pocket of energy found in an electromagnetic wave is equal to H. That's a constant. So that stays the same times frequency. So what we can do if you play with the mass, H is a constant, so it's never going to change. If I make F bigger, if I make that number bigger, E is going to go bigger. That is a direct proportion relationship. So we write that frequency is directly proportional to energy or energy is directly proportional to frequency if H is constant. I hope that makes sense. So if the one gets bigger, the other one gets bigger as well. There we go. Frequency is directly proportional to energy, which means as the one goes up, the other one goes up by the same proportion. Then they want the frequency of wave E. Okay, so here 
we can see that there's an unknown frequency in this table. So we want F. So I'm going to put F question mark. What we do know is the energy. So I know energy of wave E is 4,97 times 10 to the negative 14 joules. I also know that all these waves travel at the same speed, which is the speed of light. So the speed, which is the speed of light C, which is 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. So let's look at the formulas and decide which one I'm going to use. If we look up at our formulas, we can see that I am looking for frequency. Okay, I'm looking for frequency. Looking for frequency and I have energy. So it makes sense to use this one actually. We don't need to get fancy. We know H is a constant. All I'm doing is I'm looking for frequency. So we're going to write our formula first. E is equal to HF. That's our formula mark. We're going to substitute in. So in the place of E, I'm going to put 4,97 times 10 to the negative 14. Sorry, I have to squash it in there sideways. H is a constant. It's 6,63 times 10 to the negative 34. Times 10 to the negative 34. And I'm looking for F. Now, please do the maths correctly here. In order to get F, in order to solve for F, and in order to get F by itself, I need to divide both sides by 6,63 times 10 to the 34. So on your calculator, you're going to use brackets because sometimes your calculator gets weird if you don't. You're going to take this number over here, the energy value 4,97 times 10 to the negative 14, and you're going to divide it by this value. So F is going to be 7,5 times 10 to the 19 hertz. So again, blank formula, substitute, answer with unit. Over here, we want the wavelength of D. So if you look at the information for D, we have frequency and we have energy, but we want wavelength. So the formula that actually makes sense here is going to be this one. E is equal to Planck's constant multiplied by C divided by wavelength. Okay, you can put these two together on the numerator, that's fine. Because remember, this is technically over 1, which means both technically over wavelength. So H is Planck's constant. It's 6, 6,63 times 10 to the negative 34. C is the speed at which all electromagnetic waves travel, 3 times 10 to the 8. The wavelength is what we're looking for. So this is what I'm looking for. It's my unknown. I leave it open. And energy, okay? energy. Where do I get energy from? I get it from here. Okay, my energy is 1 comma 1 9 times 10 to the negative 15. Now when you are solving and your variable is at the bottom, so you see it's in the denominator, what's going to happen is this thing over here and this over here is basically going to swap places. So the wavelength is going to be equal to all of that stuff. Okay, that's 6 comma 6, 3 times 10 to the negative 34, 3 times 10 to the 8, divided by 1 comma 1, 9 times 10 to the negative 15. Okay, so they swap places and you get the wavelength as being 1 comma 6, 7 times 10 to the negative 10 meters. You could have also used this formula. C is equal to frequency times wavelength. We know C, it's 3 times 10 to the 8. We know frequency, it's given to us in the table over here. Try both options, you'll see that you get the same answer for wavelength. 8.4 asks which wave has the higher penetrating ability. Now, penetrating ability is directly related to the energy. The higher the energy of the wave, the higher the penetrating ability. That's why gamma rays, which has the highest frequency, and therefore the highest energy has the highest penetrating ability. So if we look at what we just worked out, well, we know that the highest frequency on the table, the highest energy on the table is actually wave E. Okay. However, the question asks us to compare A and B. So between A and B, which one has a higher energy? B. Which one has a higher frequency? B. Therefore, which one will have a higher penetrating ability? B. The reason for your answer is as follows. You can say highest frequency or highest energy. 
you don't, it doesn't matter which one you choose because the frequency is directly proportional to the energy anyway. Right, now we've got an electrostatics question. Question 10. The formulas for this section over here. If you want more videos on electrostatics, click the link up above. I have videos on that. But basically we have two spheres P and Q on insulated stands. They give me the charge of P, it's a negative charge. The charge of Q is unknown. Okay, so I'm gonna write here Q initial for sphere Q is unknown. This is the initial charge of P, okay? The initial charge of Q, the initial charge for Q, I don't know. Okay, so I know that's confusing. Initial charge of Q, okay? Calculate the number of electrons in excess on sphere P. Now let's just quickly speak about that first. How do I know that there are electrons in excess? Remember, you can either have electrons in excess or in deficits, or you can have an equal number of electrons and protons. If you don't know what I'm saying, you've got to go watch my videos. Now, we know that there's an excess number of electrons here because this sphere has a negative charge, and ne electrons are negative. So if it has a negative charge, it means it has too many electrons. It has an excess of electrons. So in order to calculate the number of electrons, as soon as you see calculate the number of you're going to go ahead and use this formula. N is equal to Q over QE. As soon as you see, calculate the number of electrons. That's because number of electrons is N. Calculate the number of electrons. QE, as I mentioned earlier, that's a constant. That's on your formula sheet. So calculate the number of electrons in excess on sphere P. Well, we need to first work out the change in charge on sphere P. So it was initially neutral, and then it became that charge. So its final charge is this. Its initial charge was zero. Therefore, the change in charge is negative three times 10 to the negative six. So basically, when they ask you to calculate the number of electrons in excess or in deficits on a sphere, this Q over here is the charge of that sphere. The negative is not necessary. For this formula in particular, you don't need to sub negatives in. I'm gonna say it again, up to matric. When I mark matric final papers, we don't need you to sub the negative in, okay? The charge of an electron is negative 1,6 times 10 to the negative 19. How did I know that? Well, I know that off the top of my head, but it is on your formula sheet. So look it up. Don't think you can say it out of your head. Sometimes I also get it wrong. These negatives are optional. So you don't have to put them in. This formula, don't need to put in the signs. Okay, the reason why is because we're working out a number. A number of things can neg never ever be negative. If I ask you the number of chocolates you eat, it's not going to be negative. It's never going to be negative. You either eat zero chocolates or you eat a positive number of chocolates. Okay, so you type it into your calculator. It does help to use brackets around if you're using scientific notation. And you should get 1,88 times 10 to the power of 13 electrons. Okay, not necessary to write the electrons in there. It's not really a unit, but I mean, why not? Okay, that's your answer. For the next question, you have to read this little bit of information. They say the two spheres are now brought into contact. Okay, and then they return to their original position. So here, what they showed me over here, this was an unknown charge, and this was a negative three times 10 to the negative six charge. That was the initial positions before they touched. Then they touched, and then afterwards, each charge had each sphere had a charge of negative one times 10 to the negative six. So basically what's happening here is we've got P initial, the initial charge of P is negative three times 10 to the negative six coulombs. The final charge of P is negative one times 10 to the negative six coulombs. For Q, we had some unknown initial charge. Okay, some unknown initial charge. And the final charge, remember the final charge for both of them will always be the same. Okay, so they want us to work out the original charge on Q. That's what they want us to work out. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the formula that represents, let me just check that's the next question, yeah. We're going to use this formula over here. And this formula is what you use when two spheres come into contact, touch, and are separated again. Just note that this Q over here always represents the final charge. These Qs over here represent the initial charges. So for that example that we were looking at, if we use Q, it's 
so I'm going to just make this writing a bit smaller quickly. If we look at this formula over here, as I mentioned, this Q over here is the final charge. Remember the final charge on both of them is the same, so I'm just going to put negative 1 times 10 to the negative 6. And yes, in this formula, you must substitute the signs. You must, 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 must. Then Q1 is the initial charge on the first sphere, so that sphere. So it's negative 3 times 10 to the negative 6. Plus Q2, we do not know. We just have, we just know that it's an unknown. That's my variable. Divide by 2. It's divide by 2 because there's two spheres. So how you solve for this is you first take the divide by 2 over and it becomes this number multiplied by 2. And then you subtract the negative 3 times 10 to the negative 6. So you go negative 1 times 10 to the negative 6 times 2, get an answer. And then you minus negative 3 times 10 to the negative 6. So minus, minus. And we get our final charge. Well, not our final charge, our answer, our final answer, which is actually the initial charge on Q to be 1 times 10 to the negative 6 coulombs. If you don't put your unit, you're going to get your answer wrong. 10.3 asks if electrons were transferred from P to Q or Q to P. Well, we know that P had that charge and Q initially had that charge. We just worked that out from the previous question. So that was the answer to 10.2. And you need to remember that electrons always go from the more negative sphere, the more negative sphere to the less negative sphere. So in our situation, P was more negative. See, negative three. Q, less negative. So it went from P to Q. That's where we're going to stop for today, guys. If you want to see electricity, magnetism, any of the equations of motion, graphs of motion, all of that sections in another video, please let me know in the comments below. Let me know what other papers you want me to do. And I really hope you subscribe so I can help you with maths and physical sciences. Um, and yeah, I hope you guys have a wonderful day. See you in the next video.